Welcome to CollabCast with Sam Brown. This week, we actually have a couple of presenters that we are really excited to have today. Um, we have Pete Anello. He's a Microsoft Teams Senior Technical Specialist. And we also have Craig Eidelman. And he is here for security and compliance. And he's a specialist for Microsoft as well. So we've gotten a lot of inquiries about security in particular when it comes to Microsoft Teams for a ton of our customers, especially in healthcare. Definitely want to get you the information that you need. So with that, if you could go to the next slide, Craig, we're just going to go through a couple of housekeeping items. And first of all, wanted to let you know that all of these resources, including the recording and anything relevant that we talk about on this call, it's all going to be available for you on our blog. It's our HLS blog, aka.ms slash HLS blog. If you haven't taken a look, definitely do. There's a ton of resources for you there. We do a lot of these webcasts. A lot of our specialists are doing uh, write-ups as well. So Take a look, and then as of tonight, all of the resources for this will be available there as well. So next slide, please. What we're going to do today is that we want to make sure that this is engaging, right? We have a presentation, and Pete and Craig have done a great job putting that together. But we also want you to know that we are here to answer your questions. So please, please, please engage. Uh, I'm just going to show you exactly where you can do that on the right hand side within Teams, but we want to make sure that we get your questions answered. We also want to know where you're from. So if you have, a, a, we'll do some shout outs during the webcast, but definitely let us know where you're coming in from. We get people from all over the world and we, and we want to know where you're coming in from and be able to relate to you even more. So with that, this is where you go in. Up on the right hand side, there's a question and answer. It looks like a question mark and if you go to the next slide you can see okay this is actually where you put in your comments and your questions and I'm going to be moderating so I'm going to either respond to you privately or if we get a lot of themes around the same question I'm going to queue those up for Pete and Craig to answer so we're here for you today and um, with that definitely want to get the presentation started so with that I'm going to turn it over to Craig for Microsoft Teams and Security. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Craig Eidelman. So I am a senior security specialist on the Microsoft Healthcare team. So today we're going to talk about how uh, you can use some of the best practices that we offer around securing Microsoft Teams. So as we know, uh, Microsoft Teams is the hub for teamwork and uh, for Microsoft 365. We've got integrated chat and meeting, uh, calling, uh, of course, file and application sharing. So there's a lot that you can do here. And of course, when it comes to security, what can you do? What policies you couldn't, can, can you put in place? What control controls can you put in place to enable security as well as compliance. Um, and how we approach that is we focus on the different layers of security. So you hear about defense in depth, uh, security layers. What can you do to protect each layer uh, that your end users are going to come into contact with? And also how can administrators get access to the right tools and the right um, uh, reporting capabilities to understand what's going on in that environment. In order to do this, we're going to focus on these really these uh, four key areas in the presentation today. I'm going to talk about identity and access management. So how do you secure people accessing Teams? Um, how do you manage those users? How do you protect those users? Um, how do you protect the application? The Teams app is going to be sitting on uh, an iOS device, an Android device, a web browser, on a PC or on a Mac. Um, how can you protect the application to secure the foundational aspects of the application is secure? And then how do you protect the information inside Inside the application. So this is with a chat, this is with a file. Um, since SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business is that underlying layer for, um, for collaboration on files, there's a lot that you can do both within Teams and with the underlying platform to ensure that you're going to be secure. And then Pete at the very end is going to talk about what you can do to secure the individual, me individual meetings itself. Um, so without any uh, further ado, let's get started with identity and access management. So how do you secure those identities and control access? So Azure Active Directory is the identity and access management platform that's underlying to all of uh, the Microsoft 365 platform, pretty much anything in the Microsoft Cloud. So if you're logging on to Azure as an administrator, um, there's Azure Active Directory. If you're going to be logging on to Microsoft Dynamics, you're gonna be logging in through Azure Active Directory. And if you're going to be if, uh, eventually creating an application with consumers, you can actually add their identities into Azure Active Directory as well. So Azure Active Directory is, a, is the world's largest cloud identity service. We've got some great stats here about the scale that it applies to. 
But you know, when it comes to Azure Active Directory, people are going to be logging in with something. And what are they logging in with? Well, most likely it's a username and a password. And guess what? Uh, passwords are kind of that main, uh, you know, uh, the the main cause of those breaches that are out there. So people write those passwords down. I know we're we're in healthcare, so I've been to multiple of my customers, and I've been meeting with clinical folks and 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 the business folks behind uh, these these facilities. And of course, there are many times you walk by a keyboard and you see a post-it note with a little password on it. Or uh, you know, I've talked to several physicians who they 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 have their ID cards on their shoulder and they flip it over, and there's a post-it note that tapes there with all their usernames and passwords on it. And that's not really great security. Um, of course, passwords are the, the really the number one uh, beachhead into systems. So uh, there's lots of passwords available for sale on the, on the web if you want to start uh, doing password spray attacks and other types of breach attacks that are out there. Um, but what we need to really look at is how can we secure that password? Um, how can Azure Active Directory help with that? And also, how can you re reduce costs? So when it comes to, 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 to security, there is multi-factor authentication. That is going to be the number one way to secure access to Teams. So as your users are logging onto their mobile device, logging onto a web browser to access Teams on a non-managed device potentially, um, they're going to use type of their username, we're going to type in their password, but then you want to have that second factor of security that, that comes out there. So with the Microsoft Authenticator app that's, that's part of Azure Active Directory, you can provide that one-time passcode, so that six-digit code, an SMS, phone call, an SMS or a phone call, um, uh, or even a push notification to, to that device. All can be done through the Authenticator, or, or pretty much there's also all sorts of other uh, multi-factor authentication applications out there. What we're adding now, which might be useful, especially to our healthcare customers, is looking at uh, uh, FIDO security. So using uh, a badge, using a USB device. I've got a FIDO security device right here that I use to log into my, uh, my Azure tenant here. So that's where I don't have to have a password. We're essentially using uh, the passwordless technology uh, that that Microsoft is bringing is, is bringing to bear. So um, highly recommend looking at this. One of the other things I would also suggest looking at is is Windows Hello. Uh, Windows Hello for business specifically on your Windows devices uh, that uses your face. So if you're using uh, devices that have the, the correct camera, um, you can sign in just by looking at your device, or you can use a PIN. Uh, that uh, Windows Hello for business PIN uh, is tied to a, a your TPM chip and a certificate on your device. So there is actually a second factor there. It's something you know, which is your your PIN something you have, which is that certificate tied to that TPM device. So highly recommend if you're, if you're looking to on corporate devices uh, for Windows Hello for Business, uh, especially to make that experience a little better for your user, that's going to be the way to do that. And this works for home devices. So you know, like, uh, we've got lots of customers who've, who've said to me, you know, People have their mobile devices. How do we enable them to use their home devices, especially now with, with COVID and people potentially not working from a corporate device or not having those devices available? You can secure that that uh, that personal device uh, with policies from Microsoft Intune, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but you can enable Windows Hello for Business on those devices too. So you really can uh, reduce the risk of attack around passwords by protecting it with, uh, with multi-factor authentication. So now that we've that user typed in that username and then typed in that password, uh, how can we make sure that they, they really are who they are when they get, get to Microsoft Teams? So that's where conditional access is part of Azure Active Directory to, to control that. So you can look at the various signals or the various conditions that come into play. So the user, uh, their location, the type of device they're using, is it a Mac, is it a PC, is it an iOS device, is it an Android device? Um, the type of application that they're coming into. So are they using the Teams app uh, on their phone? Are they using the Teams app on their PC? Are they using a web browser to get an to get access in. And then also looking at real-time risk analytics behind the scenes. How often have they come in from this single device? How often do they come in from this IP address, from this location? Are they moving locations too quickly? Once you look at those signals, then you can after, then you can determine, well, we want to get them in, but what, what level of access do we want to get them in? So you can allow access, but require a multi-factor authentication challenge. Uh, again, talked about that before, that's critically important to ensuring the security of, of those users. Uh, you can limit access. So this is something that's part of micro, uh, Microsoft 365 built into the platform, especially for uh, Outlook uh, OWA and for SharePoint and OneDrive, is the ability to limit access, to prevent people from downloading files. So you can log in, and gain access to Word documents, but only view them in the web browser through the, the web apps, but not be able to download or print or, or uh, any of those files themselves. So you're, you're giving people access to the documents and to what they need to do to do their work, but not the capability to actually download those files to those devices. And of course, you can block access. So maybe uh, the device they're coming from is non-compliant, and maybe they're using a, a PC that doesn't and isn't enabled with BitLocker encryption, for example. Um, that can be part of device compliancy, which can come from Microsoft Intune uh, to determine whether or not they should gain access. 
So conditional access, those rules you put in, are going to help you develop policies to determine, well, you're coming from an, uh, uh, your, your iOS device, your, it's a corporate managed device, so you're okay. You're coming in from uh, your, your Android device, it's not managed, so we're going to enable uh, application policies to protect the application. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit later in more detail. Um, so when you develop these policies, you can put them to play with conditional access and that will enable security into that environment. So what does some of this look like? So a couple of screenshots here. Uh, so you can see here I've got a Microsoft Teams of that application I'm going to choose from my, my cloud app. Uh, and then uh, this is an example of, of, of what you're going to get uh, as, as a message. So this user is coming in from an, an unmanaged device and saying, you know what, this, doesn't, this device or client doesn't meet that policy, so you're not going to get in. So a uh, message to the users to let them know, hey, the device you're using, doesn't meet doesn't meet our needs. Um, but again, like I said before, you have the limited access policies from unmanaged devices. So maybe you don't want to have this message pop up. You just want to have users get in, but have a little bit of, of less functionality to download and remove that data from that environment. That that's usually an option we see a lot of customers starting to use. Or maybe people are coming from a different location uh, that you might not want them to come from. I've got customers who said, you know, we, there are certain countries uh, that are all over the world that we know we don't have our employees going to. Even if they're on vacation, we really don't want them coming in. We don't want them working when they're on that vacation especially. So uh, we're going to prevent access from those locations. So this is another way, another message that would come up to the user to say, you know what, the device you're coming from is, in a, is it somewhere in a spot that we don't need. It doesn't meet their requirements to reach, to reach those resources. So again, this is more about preventing that type of access to that environment. Um, but now we've got external collaboration. We've got people who uh, you know, are not part of your organization. Uh, that's one of the great benefits of Teams is that I can uh, collaborate with people not part of my company, but maybe we're working on a project with a, with a partner or a vendor, um, but we want to bring them into, their, into our systems. Uh, traditionally, a lot, of, a lot of my customers have gone in and created Azure Active, uh, Active Directory accounts for them on premises, gave them another username and password and said, okay, vendor, if you want to gain access, uh, here's the VPN. You can get to our SharePoint site on premises, and uh, here's your username and password. But again, we want to get away from that. We don't want people to really use separate username and password usernames and passwords. So the way we kind of define this in, in Teams is you've got your invited member. So someone from an external organization who you want to gain access to those sites. You can use Azure Active Directory uh, business to business or B2B guest access to give those invited members access to your team site and also, of course, the, share, the underlying SharePoint site underneath that. Then you've got potentially a targeted guest. So that is an external user that's just there to maybe access a file. You're sharing one individual file with somebody. You can control access of that too. Maybe you only want to allow certain individuals and certain organizations to, to, to do that, but maybe not allow, in this case, it shows you like a public email address like Outlook.com to gain access to it. So you can set up these type of rules inside, uh, in, inside Teams and SharePoint Online to really determine you know, what level of access do we want our guest users to have. And again, we want collaboration, but we want to control that. That can be controlled inside uh, the Teams uh, admin center to say, you know what, we're going to allow guest access in, in Teams or even allow guest access to certain teams. And you can control how you want to do that. Do you want everybody to invite guest, at, guest users or just some people? Do you want to use Azure Active Directory business to business or B2B users as those guest users, which again, I would highly recommend. Um, as you can see here, you can allow those people to bring their own identities into your guest organization, into your org, so you're not really giving them a, a separate username and password. Again, redu reduction of risk. More and more usernames and passwords that are out there that you're giving to these vendors, uh, the less likely that they are uh, to remember that and maybe have to, type, to write down those passwords or share them among those guest organizations. If it's tied to an individual user, so this could be uh, their social account, so like a you know, um, uh, you know, a Microsoft account or, or, or a Google account, um, but really you want to tie that to their organizational identity. So B2B guest access facilitates that to have access with uh, very specific organizations. So you might want to say, all right, everybody in this company or only certain people in this company can have access uh, to our guest site. We're going to give them access to those guest sites on a temporary basis. Uh, because one other part, uh, a feature of Azure Active Directory is on the uh, access review side, so on identity governance, uh, to be able to review access. So I've given this vendor access to our site. It's been six months. The project's over. Uh, we need to review that and then determine, you know what, they really don't need access anymore. The project's over. We can automatically remove that, that access. Or, you know what, they still do need access because even though the project's over, we, we want them to continue to have access to those documents for 
another few months. So access reviews, the ability to kind of look at uh, the, the who's accessing your, your uh, resources, and then of course, be able to review that and determine who needs access for how long can be automated. So maybe the manager of that team uh, can review that, not, not necessarily IT. So access reviews, identity governments, a good, a good uh, uh, functionality, a part of Azure AD to help secure those identities. So before I move on to the next uh, next slide, application protection, just want to talk about this, uh, kind of summarize. Azure Active Directory is the underlying uh, identity layer uh, for access to Microsoft Teams. Uh, you can use conditional access policies to create uh, rules to determine who and when should have a should have access from what types of devices. Uh, they're going to get uh, messages that are going to let them know, hey, you're using the wrong type of device. Uh, and also using multi-factor authentication as, as part of that logon flow to ensure that user really is who they say they are by having that second factor added in. So now let's talk about application protection. So the user's logged in. I have typed in my username and password. Let's say I'm on my, my iPhone, uh, but now I want to get use that application. How do we secure that, app, that application itself? Uh, that's really where Microsoft Endpoint Manager, so uh, the new uh, way of approaching endpoint management. So this could be uh, using Configuration Manager or Microsoft Intune. Those two solutions have now combined to, con to form Endpoint Manager to, to control access to those applications, to control access to those desktops to provision desktops. Again, probably not going to talk about that today. It's a different topic for a different time. Uh, but let's focus specifically on what Intune can really do as part of Microsoft Endpoint Manager to control access to those applications. Um, so there's there's two ways to protect that type of data on, on a device. So there's mobile device management. So I'm going to restrict access based on the device itself. So I have to enroll that device in, in uh, Microsoft Intune. Uh, so I have more control over that device. This is good for corporate users, corporate owned devices. I've got customers who do this for their personal devices. They want to have a little bit more control over those devices. Of course, a lot of our customers who have physicians, um, you know, they're kind of not really interested in having the hospital that they're affiliated with uh, manage those their personal devices fully. So what you can do is now apply mobile application management or application protection policies to the apps themselves. What that does is it decouples the application management from device management. So you just have control over the applications to apply security policies to the apps themselves and not necessarily manage the device. That becomes very interesting for customers who want to use uh, Microsoft Teams on personal devices, but again, not have to manage and go through the process of controlling the device itself. You're just controlling the applications. So the user logs in, again, with conditional access, making sure everything's okay, and then a policy is downloaded to that application after they have successfully authenticated, where you can uh, control things like preventing copy-paste, preventing saving to uh, non-corporate locations, and I'll show you how that works in a, in a few minutes. So how do we do this in our applications? Well, Microsoft Office 365 applications uh, support uh, multi-identity policies. Because our applications are used both for your personal life and for your business life, uh, we don't want to have two separate applications. You don't need Outlook for personal and Outlook for corporate. You want to have the one Outlook app. And inside the application is where we segregate the data. So you've got your corporate data, so your Exchange account, your Office 365 account, and your personal data. So your Outlook.com, your Gmail, Yahoo, whatever email uh, service you use on that device. The data is separate uh, inside those applications. And you can enforce policies to ensure that data is not allowed to traverse from the corporate locations to the personal locations. So for example, I've got a Word document uh, that can, ha again, be personal or, or, or corporate. I can prevent people from cutting data from the, uh, the corporate data and pasting it into the personal data. I can prevent them from pasting into personal applications. Um, so I'm in the Teams app. I'm going to cut uh, maybe some uh, information from a chat. I can be prevented from pasting that into the Notes app on iOS or a different account in Outlook for, for personal. Uh, but maybe you want to be able to cut the data from Teams and paste it into a Word document on your mobile device. Well, that document now becomes a uh, corporate managed document, and then you can ensure that it's only saved to corporate storage. So maybe you want to you prevent storage from uh, Google Drive or iCloud or my personal OneDrive account, and you save it directly to your uh, your corporate uh, One uh, OneDrive for Business account or a Teams site or a SharePoint site. So this really controls the data inside the application, uh, separate from the device, 
gives you the control, allows the users to be productive on that device from anywhere, uh, but not necessarily, uh, 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 you know, exfiltrate data from corporate locations to personal locations. So in order to do this, Intune uh, through Microsoft Endpoint Management uh, with application protection policies, APP policies you'll see in the, in the menu there. So that's how you can use, this is the next layer of protection is that application security. Uh, the, the next layer of protection inside Teams is to protect that information inside Teams itself or really virtually any uh, sort of data that's sitting inside your environment. Um, the first step is to be able to know what your data is. So where, where does that data sit? Uh, is it sitting in Teams? Is it sitting in SharePoint? Is it Teams chat? Is it an email? Or is it sitting on a file servers in, inside your environment? Uh, being able to uh, add uh, uh, governance to that data. So how long should we have those chats be around for? Maybe uh, you know certain chats are around forever and then they get hidden, but you still want to be able to view them through e-discovery. And then you want to apply policies to that data. So uh, if it's a Word document that contains uh, health information that are patient identifiers, so first name and a last name and a social security number, you want to uh, encrypt that document, add a visual marking to that document, a label, uh, somewhere maybe at a header and a footer to indicate to users that, hey, this data is sensitive. You got to be careful with it. Uh, and again, like I said before, add encryption to it to make sure that if it does leave your environment, that someone has to decrypt it or authenticate to open up that document. And therefore, if it escapes and somehow goes some, uh, somewhere where it shouldn't, uh, it, the, the data is protected. Um, so uh, in, in Teams specifically, what can we do to prevent data loss? Well, we got to make sure we monitor that content, uh, detect what's going on there. If someone has violated a policy and maybe paste something or share something they shouldn't do, and then automatically remediate it. Instead of waiting for it to be a problem, let's prevent that problem from happening in the first place. Um, so within uh, Microsoft 365 and, and Teams, uh, you have our data loss prevention policies. Uh, what's great about these policies, they don't just apply to one, uh, one product, they apply across the entire solution framework. So if you want to uh, apply a policy to detect uh, protected health information, it's not just going to necessarily have to apply in Teams chats. You can apply it to Exchange Online emails, uh, SharePoint Online, or OneDrive for Business to prevent that data from leaking. You can apply it to specific groups of users. So maybe you want to have one policy applied to uh, one set of users in, in your, your finance department and a separate set of policies applied to clinical workers when it comes to them working with data. So. Uh, you know, the granularity uh, allows you to choose that and also protect various sites. Uh, maybe you uh, want to only protect certain SharePoint sites or certain team sites with these types of policies. Um, within teams, you can control who joins a team. So if you want to uh, set it to be a private site or a public site, should this be open to the world or only be open to the set amount of people we, we want it to within your organization? Or maybe you don't want guest access to that, like I showed you before using Azure Active Directory uh, B2B collaboration for your guests. Um, so you, can, you have that ability to, to choose who can access those devices. And again, goes back to what I said before for here with unmanaged devices, prevent people from being able to download data and only have web only access to those sites or again, block access completely. Um, so that's how you can control access to those specific devices. Uh, the ability to protect data at the document level. So I've got a document that contains sensitive information. It may be a merger and acquisitions document that uh, your legal and finance teams are working on. It might, in, in our case with healthcare customers, we contain patient information. Um, how can you protect that? You can automatically label that document and then based on that label, protect it. Or in this case, in this in this image here, you can go and manually protect that document. And, and if users can recognize it, hey, I'm working with patient information, this is confidential or this contains PHI, we wanna make sure it's sensitive. Uh, you can enable that through through uh, through uh, Microsoft uh, information protection. One of the other things to note too is that this is in preview is the policy simulator is the ability to go in and kind of look and see how these policies are going to affect your affect your data because it's very important as as you start developing a labeling and classification strategy that you really get a better understanding of are our policies too restrictive are they not restrictive enough are users overriding and justifying uh, that they're sharing a little bit more often than they should uh, are we educating the users in the best way a lot of this document protection is less about the technology that's enabled and more about educating your users on the proper policies and procedures and processes to protect that information. Um, so just make sure that if you start going down this journey, have a good plan in place because uh, you don't want to over complicate your users when it comes to prote protecting their information. We also have data loss prevention in Teams chats. So it's not just about blocking that information. It's also educating the user on what's going to happen. I have some, I'll show you what this is going to look like in a minute. But you can see in this, in this example, uh, this person was going to be uh, pasting um, uh, PCI information, so credit card information into a chat and that got blocked. 
Um, yeah, again, you might want to allow that internally, but maybe not allowed externally to external users. So you can, can, you can granularly control these policies and determine how you want to enable uh, DLP inside Microsoft Teams. So I, I said before, how do we apply uh, a container label in Teams? So uh, this is uh, um, uh, on the SharePoint side or on, on the entire site. We want to make sure that this site is, is private and only have members of, of the site. If they're coming from an unmanaged device, potentially uh, only allow limited web access to that specific device itself. So this is what the, the admin experiences looks like. Um, so the team owner, when they create that site, uh, when they want to create it, they can choose, well, this is going to be a confidential site, so therefore it's going to be a private site, or we're going to enable it to be a public site. Um, and then the experience for the end user when they log in and they want to, from an unmanaged device, they get this nice window on the top, uh, this message on the top of, the, of the, uh, the browser menu to show, hey, your organization doesn't allow you to do something on this. What's going to be important too is this is going to be consistent across the board. So when I log into a SharePoint site, when I log into my OneDrive or business site, or if I log into my Exchange Online uh, OWA app on my device and I'm on an unmanaged device, I'm going to have that same message on my device. So very important there. And then if you want to enable someone to use it on a device, they can have that device managed via Intune, apply a compliance policy to that device, and therefore when it becomes compliant, it's managed, and it's okay for them to use. Uh, that message would go away, and they can download uh, uh, documents from that site on that, on that trusted device. So again, it depends on how you want to enable device trust. Do you want to allow personal devices? Do you want to not allow personal devices? Do you want to allow your trusted devices, so your domain joint trusted managed devices to gain access to, to information from wherever you, wherever you are? All those policies can be, be configured with Azure Active Directory and conditional access policies to determine who should have access to what. When it comes to applying a sensitivity, sensitivity, sensitivity label in a document, I'm going to show you what this means to do it manually. So I'm going to be here in a team site. I'm going to go to the files tab in here to open up a specific file. I've got an, a document here. I'm going to open that up in the web viewer. Uh, and again, this would also apply not just only in the web viewer, but in, in the, uh, Word doc, uh, the Word app on those uh, people's devices as well. I'm going to edit that document. And then you see here in the, on the very far right hand side, we've got sensitivity labels that we can uh, uh, apply to that document. So as a end user, I can manually apply this confidential label to that document. And then based on the policy, I could ensure that the, uh, the, uh, wor the Word document has a header or a footer that says this is confidential. That confidential label will stay on it. So you'll see that visual indicator uh, uh, potentially wherever you are. You'll also see that in SharePoint sites too, because we're, we're bringing that functionality out. We'll be able to see uh, the, the confidentiality or the sensitivity of that document inside, the, um, inside SharePoint Online. So we're really trying to get your users to better understand where the document is, how to secure it, and how to apply the right label. And again, I said too, you could add it with a confidential label on top of it, the ability to encrypt the document. Uh, and you'll still be able to do, if you're using Microsoft Information Protection, to use the web viewers to edit that document, to use uh, document um, uh, collaboration, to do e-discovery, all uh, through, uh, through Microsoft 365. So adding that confidential label is gonna give you, uh, you know, the security on the encryption on the document, but with, uh, with still have the administrative tools you would need uh, to view and, and discover that type of document. Uh, finally, let's look at how we're going to do this in a, in a chat. So this is the next experience. So talked about documents. Now let's talk about the chat itself. So I'm in a one-to-one -one chat with somebody. Uh, I'm going to be sending that end user. Um, maybe this is an external user. Uh, in this case, I'm going to send them information about a patient. So uh, you got a first name, or excuse me, a last name, and then some diagnosis codes there. Um, the end user would see that their message is blocked. Uh, I can't send this. Uh, well, why can't I send that? Uh, and also on the the receiver side, this is what they would see as well, that the message is actually blocked uh, due to sensitive content. Uh, and then as the end user who sent that message, I can actually get in and see why was it blocked? Well, in this case, it had, um, you know, classification uh, of, uh, of health information in there. Um, and so in order to, if you, you can enable over uh, the ability to override. So maybe this end user says, you know what, I'm working with another physician outside our company. I, I really need to get this person that information. So I'm going to override that and type in a justification. Again, it's all logged. So you can go back and uh, run reports to determine, well, how many people are, are, are typing in justifications? Is it too many people typing in justifications? Are, we, are, are our rules too tight? Or are people trying to exfiltrate data? 
are people not typing in proper justifications? I had one customer who turned this on and people weren't typing in them. They were just typing in AAA and, and things that they probably shouldn't. And so uh, IT had a security had to talk with them and said, you know what? We really need to understand why you're doing this because we want to protect our health information. And for the most part, people who uh, want who people are want to do the right thing and want to protect their their patient information or any sort of uh, protected information. So uh, you can uh, make sure that this is not just a uh, you know a gate, but it's also an educational tool that you can apply to your users. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Pete now to talk about individual meeting security. Uh, if you have any questions about anything I discussed about identity and access management, uh, device and application management and security, as well as uh, security inside the application itself, just type it in the chat window and we'll, we'll respond. So uh, Pete, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, and I think actually before we get to Pete, it might be a good place to stop. We have a ton of good questions and a lot of common themes about what you just presented, Craig. So maybe we sure. can stop here for a second. Sure. Okay, awesome. So uh, what? So one of the things that people are asking about is, well, first of all, let me let me address a lot of the questions we're getting around the resources. So we'll we will post this recording and also the resources in our blog after this. It's aka.ms slash HLS blog, and we'll have a slide at the end for you as well. Um, so don't worry about, about having to memorize all of this. It's there for you. So um, we have some questions around classification. So whether or not the customer can control the either high level, whether it's on and off for classifications or at a granular level, item by item. I know you had that line showing on your slide, but uh, if you could just go into that in a little bit more detail, that'd be great. So you can control, uh, you know, where the, uh, if a document is automatically classified or manually classified, you can apply classifications to users and groups. So maybe specific sets of users have certain classifications. Um, so where I've seen this particular is around like an HR department. Um, they're going to have a, a separate levels of classifications to look at personnel documents, uh, documents that may be considered sensitive that contain information about discipline uh, and also resume information. Uh, so they can have their one set of, uh, of classification labels. So you you can determine who has what type of labels and how it would be specifically applied to certain documents based on the user, based on their, you know, and based on the group. Awesome. Awesome. And um, we do have some questions coming in about the clients that are supported. So um, which which clients are particularly supported when it comes to Mac or Android, et cetera. And Craig, feel free to add on. But one of the things that we kept getting feedback on at Microsoft was the fact that a lot of our uh, productivity tools have an inconsistent experience across devices and across different um, different clients. And one of the things and the reasons that team was created, Teams was created was so that you get that consistency no matter which device or which browser or which phone um, system you're joining from. So um, absolutely, it, it, the, the things that Craig is talking about apply across all of the different clients that you might be joining from, but I don't know if you have anything to add there, Craig. Yeah, so engineering is right now in the process of, of unifying that type of experience. So uh, you'll have sensitivity labels in the same spot across iOS, Android, Mac, and, and, PC, and your PC. Uh, there is uh, for Mac and, and PCs, there is a client that uh, that you'll be that you deploy today, but pretty soon that's going to be just part of the office uh, the office tool itself. Um, to uh, enable sensitivity labels natively inside those office documents. So it's coming together uh, over the next few months. Uh, you'll have that consistent experience across all those devices. Awesome. And on the confidential labels, uh, is there a way to run reports to see the dispersion of the data marked? Um, anything like that that's easily accessible on the administrative side? So yes, everything is logged. Uh, so there are logs uh, when it talks about why uh, why labels were applied. Um, so you can use reporting tools. So Power BI, for example, to pull that out. I know that there's actually some uh, there's some reports that are available in the older console. So in the Azure Information Protection console, they they built some reports in there. They're moving those reports uh, eventually into the Microsoft 365 console. You can see a lot uh, in the uh, in the um, information protection dashboards there. So you'll get some high level information and you can dig deeper through those dashboards itself too. Perfect. And so when you were showing the pin, um, the security controls based on like Microsoft Hello and pin for access, um, we have questions around 
can the pin have security controls, like maybe the length of the pin, whether it's four characters, eight, et cetera? Yes, you can add those policies. You can add some yeah, policies of the pin. Awesome. OK, awesome. And I think um, the last one is just some questions around MAM and MDM. So can you leverage MAM if you're not using Intune as your MDM? Is there any way around that? Yeah, you don't have to use Intune as your mobile device management uh, platform. You can use uh, the, the application protection policies independent of any sort of MDM tool. So if you're using another tool, absolutely continue to you can use uh, application protection policies. Perfect. OK, so we do have some more questions coming in. Let me kind of get them grouped together and get us in a place where um, we can answer some general themes here. So thanks for your questions. Keep them coming. We're looking over them. And um, Pete, let's go ahead and go to your portion, and then we'll, we'll stop at the end and get the rest of these addressed. Sounds good. Thanks, Craig. So, uh, you know, Craig provided a ton of information, you know, across a lot of different platforms. Now, I'm, I'm really going to slow it down a little bit um, and focus on a much simpler topic, and that's that's just basically uh, meetings and some of the security we have within meetings. Good. Next slide. There you go. So, uh, first, Microsoft Teams for the meeting join URL uses a very complicated. Uh, meeting join URL, and each, each meeting identity is unique uh, and dynamic, right? So, you know, you never have the same meeting twice, essentially. And this gives you a lot of benefits, like, you know, if my call runs over five minutes and I have another call that starts at the top of the hour, you know, I don't have that overlap and, and things, things along those lines. But not only do we use complex meeting IDs, um, and have a dynamic meeting ID per meeting. Uh, with Teams, we actually use a 48 character long GUID that has uh, from A to Z, uppercase and lowercase, and zero through nine. And if you do the math, yeah, there, that, that's better. If you do the math, that's actually one followed by 86 zeros as far as how many options there are. So my point being that it's going to be impossible, you know, to guess our meeting, our meeting IDs. Very, very complicated. Next slide, please. Uh, so this slide really talks about, um, you know, meeting options from an administrative level. Um, if you're an administrator for Office 365 and Teams, you're probably already familiar with these policies, but these are policies that you can sign, you know, at the tenant level, at the user level, or you can script it and apply it to groups of users. And as Craig spoke about, you know, we have a lot of mechanisms for authenticated users or guest users, but Really, what are some of the things that we have available for an anonymous user who's joining your meeting that maybe isn't a guest? So, so these are some of the things that you can set at the tenant level. You know, who can who can start a meeting? Um, uh, you know, does PSTN participants do they bypass the lobby? Is there meeting join announcements? Things along those lines. Next slide, please. Thanks. So those, that last slide was really about, um, you know, the admin, the admin policy. This slide and the next two supporting slides really focus on end user capabilities. Um, when I have conversations with customers, I feel like, you know, these per meeting policies are typically overlooked. But what they do is they give you as a Teams user the ability to set specific controls on a specific meeting. You can do that under meeting options. You know, I have them both uh, circled in yellow on the slide, either through the, um, you know, the, the meeting details or through the Outlook client. Um, and these allow you to essentially, you know, control who can be a presenter, who can bypass the lobby, et cetera. Next slide, please. These next two slides really go into the options of the per user meeting in a little bit more detail. This slide really focuses on that meeting join experience. You know, who can bypass the lobby is a really big, you know, big question in many circumstances. 
you know, is it everyone? And you can see there's some recommended scenarios. You know, if you're having a large meeting, people coming from all over the place, maybe you have external partners coming, et cetera, you might not want to be in the business of, you know, adding, you know, uh, people from the lobby. On the flip side, you might have a very important meeting, a little bit secretive. You want to have some controls over who has access to it. You may say only the organizer or I'm sorry, only my organization can, can join the meeting. Next slide. And this one is really about, you know, the experience that a user has within a meeting based on their role. So there's three roles. There's organizer, which actually has, you know, the same types of rights as a presenter, but, you know, they are the organizer, the, the owner of the meeting. And then there's the attendee, you know, and the attendee really has a scaled down capability within the meeting. Um, you know, they can share audio, video, chat, and if PowerPoint's been shared through through the meeting, they can um, you know, preview the PowerPoint deck without making edits. Um, <clears throat> so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I know it seems maybe a little lackluster compared to all the information you know Craig provided you, but we really wanted to make sure that you know from a team's perspective, you know, whether it's, you know, guest access or identity or whether it's an external user, there's a lot of options out there for you guys. And we wanted to make sure that especially with the increased remote workforce that especially around roles within team meetings that this was brought to the forefront. Um, we have another slide after this and as Sam said, we'll share it all out, but it's just additional resources. We put together, you know, you know, whether it's the policies we talked about or some security guidance, um, also Microsoft's commitment to privacy and security, as well as some uh, tools for IT professionals on how to secure teams, especially in this new remote environment. Awesome. And if you could go to that last slide, Craig, just to reiterate for everyone, we are going to have all these resources afterwards. I'm taking uh, notes on all of the questions that we're getting. So thanks for those coming through. And we have about 18 minutes left. So let's get through these questions. So uh, one of the, the general themes is around meeting controls. So uh, Pete or Craig or any of these meeting controls license dependent, does it depend on you know which, which license you have for your users and administrators? None for the meeting controls. Everything I just outlined is just part of the team's uh, client, if, if you're using Teams meetings, uh, you have those abilities. Awesome. And and can we talk a little bit more on the governance tools for this? Maybe some management reports around user permissions and user rights and privileges. So uh, a lot of the user uh, user access and, and, and privileges will be available through the Azure AD uh, access review reports. Um, so you'll be able to find out uh, you know, what roles, uh, what uh, what permissions, and also uh, what activity people have done uh, when it comes to accessing data. So that's at the, the identity level. Perfect. Um, in terms of the uh, sensitivity labels and the DLP policies, um, is that feature going to be available soon? And and so, uh, Simon, to your question and a lot of these questions um, in terms of features and like the product roadmap, um, this is something that if you do have an ND, if your organization has an NDA with Microsoft, then your Microsoft account team will be able to address that on the upcoming features and roadmap. So definitely reach out to them. But since this is a public webcast, we can't give any of those uh, those timelines out here. But definitely reach out to your account team on that. Um, in terms of other questions that we can address here, so the confidential label in Microsoft Teams that forces private teams, um, is, that, is that still in preview? Do you know, Craig? That I am not sure of. Okay, yeah, I know we see it in our tenant, but wasn't sure if it's out GA yet. Okay. Um, 
Okay. And then is it possible to utilize AIP so that in meetings with B2B guest users, there's no confidential Word docs and those types of things can't be shared? I don't think so, but that's a great idea. I would post that to user voice um, because that's that actually makes a lot of sense. So that would be something as a customer, post that to user voice. Awesome. And can you talk about some use cases for DLP? I know you went into the technical aspects, but just some justifications you've seen with your customers around DLP and overrides. So, you know, where we've seen it, it's really, um, you know, if you have your DLP rules configured a little bit too tight, uh, you, you, uh, justifications allow people to say, you know what, I actually do need to say that there is a business case for this. So uh, the example that I used in, in the presentation was I am working with someone, uh, uh, let's say I'm in a hospital and I'm collaborating with, with an external physician. You don't allow people to send uh, protected health information out externally. But in this case, since it is a physician, you might want to allow that and allow that justification to take place. Um, so that's one example where we would see justifications be necessary. Um, but a lot of it is around, I'm, I'm creating these new rules, creating these new policies, educating users. Maybe we've turned things up too tight um, and we want to loosen these things up a little bit so that we don't prevent people from doing their work. Uh, but again, since everything is logged and tracked, you can start uh, you know, looking at the information at a high level, uh, potentially using Power BI and some of the reports there to, uh, to pull that information together. Awesome. And we have gotten a few questions that I've responded to people privately, but just to put it out there, I did uh, public, publicly uh, share one of the links around external access versus guest access. So just to break it down for a second, the first, which is external access or federation, it allows you to find and call and chat with users in other domains. But then the guest access actually lets you add individuals to your teams as a guest using their email address. And you can do more with guest access. You can collaborate them like you would with users in your organization. So we have a couple webcasts and resources around external versus guest. And um, I'll point to those in the resources after this, but have gotten a few questions on that. So that's the difference there. Um, OK, so a few more questions here. Um, when when you're setting a uh, multiple Office 365 tenants, will that be in complex organizations as a set of cross tenant functions? Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about having your own organization's tenant versus setting up multiple and how this would affect it security wise within teams. Any insights there, Craig or Pete? I'm not sure if I follow the question. Yeah, maybe we can get more more context on this one. Yeah, uh, the, then, the only thing I would say, I guess, is a tenant is considered to be a separate entity uh, from another tenant. Um, so we don't really see, um, you know, the ability to manage these tenants as a single organization because they are by itself designed to be separate separate organizations. Um, yeah. If that's where your answer, it, it, it's kind of yeah. that's where your question is. Yeah, so maybe um, it was an anonymous question, uh, but yeah. maybe just put some clarifying tips in there. Maybe we can get back to you on the resources side. Uh, so another one is coming in from Thomas, and he's asking, can you prevent the creation of public teams and make it so that you can only have private teams? So you can create a security group for people that are allowed to create teams and lock that down. Um, but he wants to know if you can prevent the creation of public teams. Uh, the only way I, so the sensitivity labels are a good way to accomplish that, right? But it does require the end user to take action to choose confidential. It, it's not programmatic. If, if there is no way without taking sort of <clears throat> draconian measures or, or leveraging a partner, maybe like Avpoint that I know of to be able to force uh, only, only private teams to be created. Yeah. OK, thanks, Pete. Uh, that, that, that said, you know, I mean, there's other things that you can do as well. You know, you can, you know, you can leverage, you know, uh, you know, power automate that could run, you know, on a given 
you know, interval or, you know, when a team is created, it can trigger Power Automate to go in and identify, you know, teams um, that have been created since the last time um, the tool was run. And if it is a public team to automatically switch it from public to private, like that sort of automation can be built on the back end as well. And I have customers that, that do that type of automation for things around guest access. You know, they want to allow guest access. They don't want to necessarily turn it off, but they really want to have insight into when a team is created with guest access, um, which guest is uh, added and, you know, have the ability to sort of, you know, uh, retroactively renege that membership to that guest if the IT team seems it's appropriate. So being long winded, but there's a lot of things you can do post teams creation as well if you wanted. Awesome. Okay, and I think the the rest of the questions coming in, we've been responding to privately more of a uh, question pertaining to their particular organization. Um, but feel free, we have about 10 minutes left. Feel free to add any last minute ones. Um, but Craig and Pete, we wanna definitely thank you for your expertise here. It's been really helpful and I know a lot of my customers have had a lot of these questions. So um, thank you for that. And again, I know I've, <laughs> I'm a broken record here, but we still got questions on it coming in. So it's aka.ms slash HLS blog and it will be there. I'm gonna have this recording and resources there by the end of the day. Okay, we do have one more question in from Simon. So when he creates the team from Microsoft Teams Admin Center, he doesn't have the option to select a sensitivity option. Is this by design? You... Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I'm in my admin okay, center. I, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm sure on a certain level it's by design. I don't know if it was intentionally omitted or not. Um, you know, but it's, it's a good question and, and we can try to find the answer as part of our, our follow up when we post it. OK, perfect. Um, one person is asking, it looks like Craig's responding, so I'll just let you respond <laughs> uh, verbally here. Are there different levels of Azure AD, like Azure AD 1 versus AD 2? Okay, there's there's two. There's Azure Active Directory Premium Plan One, uh, and then Azure Active Directory Premium Plan Two. And I, I unfortunately my my, my uh, windows are being shared, but uh, you can go to uh, the Azure site and it actually lists the various features of the various uh, paid versions of Azure Active Directory. Awesome. So we'll post those afterwards as well. Uh, Thomas is asking, can I use meetings policies to set only the meeting owner can present? so that this is going to be a standard for all of his meetings uh, uh, presenter attendee controls are only at the per meeting level it, it, that's not within the meeting policy so. okay i think that's all the questions we have guys thanks so much for for joining today and we will continue having these webcasts. We have a lot coming up and they're all posted within aka.ms slash HLS blog. So thanks for joining. And Real quick, Sam. Yeah. I just went into my demo tenant to create a team through the admin portal and I'm totally able to choose private or public. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, it, it, I mean, it's there if, if I, I forget yeah. who's asking the questions, if, if they're not seeing it, um, you know, one, I'd make sure they have appropriate teams rights. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I totally have the ability to do private or public within the admin portal. Okay, good to know. So, and we'll, we'll send links to the admin portal as well, just so you can check it out. Um, all right, well, with that, I think, we are good to go and we'll look forward to seeing you on these webcasts coming up. So thanks for joining. Thanks guys. Thank you.